Hello and welcome to AP Comparative Government. Today I'm going to be talking about communism. I will not be talking about communism at an advanced collegiate level. I'm going to be talking about communism in terms of what you need to know to be successful on the AP test. So this is going to be somewhat of an overview. When we talk about communism, we have to start with the founding father of communism, or at least mo modern communism, and that is Karl Marx. In 1848, Karl Marx published what was he called the Communist Manifesto. The Communist Manifesto lays out the groundwork for his vision of society. In Karl Marx's view, there are two key principles that have always sort of been in conflict in society. Individual liberty, so liberty on the one hand, and equality on the other. At its most basic level, communism seeks to privilege equality over liberty. So in any communist state, you will see the emphasis placed on equality and away from individual liberties. Now, according to Karl Marx, from the beginning of time, society has been broken into two groups, the proletariat and the bourgeoisie. The proletariat is your working class. That's your workers. According to Karl Marx, this is the vast majority of people, and especially in certain states in the 19th century, it was the vast majority of people. The bourgeoisie are your property owners. And per Karl Marx, throughout history, even though the proletariat has been by far and away the more numerous group, the bourgeoisie, using different means of social, political, and economic control, have managed to keep the proletariat beaten down and under the foot of the bourgeoisie. So Karl Marx believes that there is only one antidote for this poison, a communist revolution. The proletariat must rise up, destroy the bourgeoisie, and reapportion their property and wealth among society in a more equitable manner. At least, that's the theory. Now, a couple of states have tried to put this into practice with varying degrees of success. In 1917, then Tsarist Russia went through a series of dramatic mini-revolutions culminating in Red October. Red October, the communists, under the leadership of Vladimir Lenin, took over the government and tried to implement a communist revolution. Now, immediately there was a problem because Karl Marx argued that before you go through your communist revolution, you needed society to industrialize. And Russia was far too agricultural, far too rural to follow those steps. Vladimir Lenin and his compatriots said, the heck with it, we're going to go forward anyway. Now, Leninism led to a couple of key concepts that are still with us today, especially if we look at modern day China. The first is called democratic centralism. Now, don't let the word democratic fool you here. This is a hierarchical party structure. The idea is that the party controls society. Society doesn't control political parties. Rather, a small minority of people control society, and those are your party members. Once you're within the party, debate is encouraged until a decision is made. But then, and this is another key tenet of democratic centralism, once the decision is made, it is to be followed throughout the state without question. This centralization of authority is a key aspect of all communist states. While states like China might have provinces, it might have village governments, and so on and so forth, make no mistake about it, it's the party that is calling the shots. And whatever the party says goes. Now, the other key concept is nomenclatura. Nomenclatura is the process of filling influential jobs in the state, society, or economy with people chosen by the party. This is the way that the Communist Party takes over society. The party chooses who to put in all these positions. They're not elected. They're not put there by merit. Individual companies aren't making these decisions. The party is the one that chooses the people. Now, critically, this process extends well beyond politics and can include people like university presidents and the heads of major mass media companies. Another attribute of communist states 
is patron clientism. And I'm going to talk about this much, much more when we get to China. So I'm only going to kind of mention it here. The idea to wrap your mind around is that party approval and party membership is the only way to get ahead in communist states. It doesn't matter how smart you are. It doesn't matter how much money you can make. It doesn't matter how effective you are as a military commander. If you're not a member of the party, then all of that counts for nothing. While communist states tend to be authoritarian in nature, their systems actually at the time that they're implemented do often allow for social mobility that didn't exist before. And the reason is, is because if there was no way up for you, you're a peasant living in the middle of nowhere Russia, but if you join the communist party, if you join the Soviets, then suddenly you can live a much, much better life. But of course, the way that we typically understand communism in the modern world is in red China. In 1949, a very, very lengthy civil war in China finally came to an end, and China became a communist state under the leadership of Mao Zedong. Let me give you a big asterisk there, because there's an exception. I did say red China, but there's an exception, and that exception is Taiwan. Taiwan is either a part of China or an independent country, depending on who you ask, and something that we will talk about more later, but just understand Taiwan is not at present a communist state. Mao Zedong was an influential, powerful leader for a very long time. He led China from 1949 to 1976. He didn't really focus on what Karl Marx said. He didn't focus on industrialization. In fact, he was a big fan of China's then existing rural village structure. So instead of that, he focused on developing a revolutionary ideal, a revolutionary fervor that he believed would strengthen society. While the Soviet Union focused on industrialization, Mao Zedong was not interested in those economic plans, at least not initially. After Mao Zedong, Xiao Ping led China. He was considerably less powerful than Mao. And actually, that tends to be a little bit of a rule until we get to China's modern leader, Xi Jinping. The leader of China, the party head, tended to lose authority from Mao's death in 1976 until Xi Jinping was elected uh, the president of the party in a couple years, about 2006. Now, Xi Jinping, however, back in the 1970s, did want to try to deal with economic issues. He instituted what was called market-based socialism, which involved infusing capitalism into a communist economy. Despite this gradual infusion of capitalism and capitalist ideas, though, things like private property, I want to make it clear, Red China has been and will always be, in its current structure, a command economy. What Beijing says goes in terms of the economy, and that puts it very much in the authoritarian category. It's all well and good to say that there's private property in China, but there are no individual civil liberties the way they're enjoyed elsewhere. Uh, early on, one of the benefits that was preached by communist societies is that women enjoy many more social rights in communist states. This is because Marxists often saw traditional gender relationships as an aspect of capitalism. This is particularly the case, by the way, with the Soviet Union. China's a different story. China kept a hold of its Confucianist principles, despite the fact that it adopted a Marxist state ideology. Confucianism is patriarchal. It's extremely patriarchal. And so even today in China, women enjoy, especially in rural areas, far, far fewer rights than their male counterparts. So this is one of those kind of exceptions to the rule. Now, as I mentioned before, in communist states, you have a command economy. There's no distinction between the government and the economy at large, at least a little, very, very little distinction. The state bureaucracy, that is the party, controls the resource allocation and oftentimes dictates the terms of corruption. This is called central planning. The central planning, so it comes from the word, you know, we have a central authority, they're doing the planning 
for the economy. Generally, communist countries are command economies, which means that the government dictates what is produced by whom and how much workers are paid. China today has made steps towards liberalizing their economy, but the state, that is Xi Jinping, remains in overall control. Communist countries that use command economies tend to suffer from two major difficulties, logistical problems and a lack of worker incentives. It's just very difficult for one organization to plan for every aspect of an economy. The logistics are so hard, and that's why that tends to be a problem. And in terms of worker incentives, because wages are often dictated by the state, by and large, and because those who get promotions tend to be party members and not those who are good at their jobs, there's a lack of worker incentives. And the logistical problems, by the way, can lead to some rather bizarre results. Consider the slide that I've got up there right now. Now, I looked at a particular plot of land that's, you know, it's about 150 miles outside of modern day Shanghai. In 1985, this farmer in this plot of land was told to grow rice. The Central Planning Committee in Beijing dictated that you now grow rice. And that continued to be the case until 1992, when the state came back and said, you're going to grow mulberry trees. I'm not particularly clear why, but they made that decision. And when they make that decision, by the way, it's not please grow mulberry trees. It's we're here with the trees and the construction equipment. We're going to dig up the rice paddies and put in the mulberry trees. So that lasted from 1992 to 1997. And in 1997, the goal was to decrease poverty. And you could sell citrus for more money than you could for the produce of a mulberry tree. So the government came back again in 1997. They came back with the construction equipment and they dug up the mulberry trees and they planted citrus trees. Now the farmer grows citrus trees. That continued to be the case until very recently in 2020. But in 2020, Xi Jinping believed that the food supply of China might be under some duress and stress in the future. And so he reversed course and said, everybody who can grow rice is going to grow rice. So they came back with the back hoes. Again, they dug up the citrus trees this time and they put back in the rice paddies. So from 1985 to 2020, we go around the block and come back to rice paddies. As you can imagine, this causes a lot of stress for farmers and a feeling of a lack of control. The last thing I want to point out is the modern idea of communism has changed a little bit in terms of how economic outlooks work. Throughout the period of the 1950s, 1960s, 1970s, especially if you look at the Soviet Union, economies were very insular. Everything that was going to be consumed in the Soviet Union was by and large produced in the Soviet Union. That's not the case anymore. China has done a very effective job of reaching out and trying to forge partnerships with different countries. In 2009, economists declared BRIC the up and coming economic engine of the world. BRIC stands for Brazil, Russia, India, and China. These four countries and their cooperation economic economists believed were going to be the driving force of economies going forward. Again, big caveat there because the invasion of Ukraine has totally derailed Russia's economy, and it is no longer nearly in the powerful position that it was prior to then. And again, despite economic changes, both China and Russia remain authoritarian governments. China has a saying, half slave and half free. The idea is that Chinese people will give up their individual liberties to the state in exchange for economic prosperity. The question remains, how long can they do it?